Hello friends and welcome to the continuation in this calm reading of the Count of Monte Cristo. Today I will be reading for you chapter 8, the Chateau d'If, as well as chapter 9, the evening of the betrothal. Chapter 8, the Chateau d'If. The commissionary of police, as he traversed the antechamber, made a sign to two gendarmes, who placed themselves one on Dante's right and the other on his left. A door that communicated with the Palais de Justice was opened, and they went through a long range of gloomy corridors, whose appearance might have made even the boldest shudder. The Palais de Justice communicated with the prison, a somber edifice that from its graded windows looked on the clock tower of the Akul. After numberless windings, Dante saw a door with an iron wicket. The commissary took up an iron mallet and knocked thrice, every blow seeming to Dante as if struck on his heart. The door opened, the two gendarmes gently pushed him forward, and the door closed with a loud sound behind him. The air he inhaled was no longer pure, but thick and mephitic. He was in prison. He was conducted to a tolerably neat chamber, but graded and barred, and its appearance, therefore, did not greatly alarm him. Besides, the words of Villefort, who seemed to interest himself so much, resounded still in his ears, like a promise of freedom. It was four o'clock when Dante was placed in this chamber. It was, as we have said, the first of March, and the prisoner was soon buried in darkness. The obscurity augmented the acuteness of his hearing. At the slightest sound he rose and hastened to the door. Convinced they were about to liberate him, but the sound died away, and Dante sank again into his seat. At last, about ten o'clock, and just as Dante began to despair, the steps were heard in the corridor. A key turned in the lock, the bolts creaked, and the massy oak door flew open, and a flood of light from the two torches pervaded the apartment. By the torchlight Dante saw the glittering sabres and carbines of four gendarmes. He had advanced at first, but stopped at the sight of this display of force. "'Are you come to fetch me?' asked he. Yes replied the gendarme, by the orders of the deputy procureur. I believe so. The conviction that they came from Monsieur de Villefort relieved all Dante's apprehensions. He advanced calmly and placed himself in the center of the escort. A carriage waited at the door, and the coachman was on the box, and the police officer sat beside him. Is this carriage for me? said Dante. It is for you, replied the gendarme. Dante was about to speak, but feeling himself urged forward, and having neither the power nor the intention to resist, he mounted the steps and was in an instant seated in sight between two gendarmes. The two others took their place opposite, and the carriage rolled heavily over the stones. The prisoner glanced at the windows. They were grated. He had changed his prison for another, that was conveying him he knew not whither. Through the grating, however, Dante saw they were passing through the Rue Caisserie, and by the Rue saint laurent and the Rue Tamarie to the quay. Soon he saw the lights of La Consigne. 
The carriage stopped, and the officer descended, approached the guardhouse, a dozen soldiers came out, and formed themselves in order. Dante saw the reflection of their muskets by the light of the lamps on the quay. Can all this force be summoned on my account? thought he. And the officer opened the door, which was locked, and, without speaking a word, answered Dante's question. For he saw, between the ranks of the soldiers, a passage formed from the carriage to the port. The two gendarmes, who were opposite to him, descended first. Then he was ordered to align, and the gendarmes on each side of him followed his example. They advanced towards a boat, which a custom-house officer held by a chain near the quay. And the soldiers looked at Dante with an air of stupid curiosity. In an instant he was placed in the stern sheet of the boat, between the gendarmes, while the officer stationed himself at the bow. A shove sent the boat adrift, and four sturdy oarsmen impelled it rapidly towards the pillon. At a shout from the boat, the chain that closes the mouth of the port was lowered, and in a second they were, as Dante knew, in the Friou and outside the inner harbour. The prisoner's first feeling was of joy at again breathing the pure air, for air is freedom, but he soon sighed, for he passed before La Reserve, where he had that morning been so happy. And now, through the open windows, came the laughter and revelry of a ball. Dante folded his hands, raised his eyes to the heaven, and prayed fervently. And the boat continued her voyage. They had passed the Tete de Mort, were now off the Ain de Faro and about to double the battery. This maneuver was incomprehensible to Dante. Whither are you taking me? asked he. You will soon know. But still, we are forbidden to give you any explanation. Dante, trained in discipline, knew that nothing would be more absurd than to question subordinates, who were forbidden to reply, and so he remained silent. The most vague and wild thoughts passed through his mind. The boat they were in could not make a long voyage. There was no vessel at anchor outside the harbour. He thought, perhaps, they were going to leave him on some distant point. He was not bound, nor had they made any attempt to handcuff him. This seemed a good augury. Besides, had not the deputy, who had been so kind to him, told him that, provided he did not pronounce the dreaded name of Nortier, he had nothing to apprehend. Had not Villefort, in his presence, destroyed the fatal letter, the only proof against him? He waited silently, striving to pierce through the darkness. They had left the Ile Rateneau, where the lighthouse stood on the right, and were now opposite the Point de Catalan. It seemed to the prisoner that he could distinguish a feminine form on the beach for it was there Mercedes dwelt. How was it that a presentiment did not warn Mercedes that her lover was within three hundred yards of her? One light alone was visible, and Dante saw that it came from Mercedes' chamber. Mercedes was the only one awake in the whole settlement. A loud cry could be heard by her. But pride restrained him, and he did not utter it. What could his guard think if they heard him shout like a madman? He remained silent, his eyes fixed upon the light. The boat went on. But the prisoner thought only of Mercedes. An intervening elevation of land hid the light. Dante turned and perceived that they had got out to sea. While he had been absorbed in thought, they had shipped their oars and hoisted sail. 
the boat was now moving with the wind. In spite of his repugnance to address the guards, Dante turned to the nearest gendarme, and taking his hand, Comrade, said he, I adjure you, as a Christian and a soldier, to tell me where we are going. I am Captain Dante, a loyal Frenchman, thought accused of treason. Tell me where you are conducting me, and I promise you, on my honor, I will submit to my fate. And the gendarme looked irresolutely at his companion, who returned for answer a sign that said, I see no great harm in telling him now. And the gendarme replied, You are a native of Marseille, and a sailor, and yet you do not know where you are going. On my honor, I have no idea. Have you no idea whatever? None at all. That is impossible. I swear to you, it's true. Tell me, I entreat. But my orders. Your orders do not forbid your telling me what I must know in ten minutes, in half an hour, or in an hour. You see, I cannot escape, even if I intend it. Unless you are blind or have never been outside the harbor, you must know. I do not. Look round you, then. Dante rose and looked forward, when he saw rise within a hundred yards of him the black and frowning rock, on which stands the Chateau d'If. This gloomy fortress which has for more than three hundred years furnished food for so many wild legends, seemed to Dante like a scaffold to a malefactor. The Chateau d'If, cried he, what are we there for? The gendarme smiled. I am not going there to be imprisoned, said Dante. It is only used for political prisoners. I have committed no crime. Are there any magistrates or judges at the Chateau d'If? There are only, said the gendarme, a governor, a garrison, turnkeys, and good thick walls. Come, come, do not look so astonished, or you will make me think you are laughing at me in return for my good nature. Dante pressed the gendarme's hand as though he would crush it. You think, then, said he, that I am taken to the Chateau d'If to be imprisoned there. It is probable, but there is no occasion to squeeze so hard. Without any inquiry, without any formality. All the formalities have been gone through. The inquiry is already made. And so, in spite of Monsieur de Villefort's promises, I do not know what Monsieur de Villefort promised you, said the gendarme, but I know we are taking you to the Chateau d'If. But what are you doing? Help, comrades, help! By a rapid movement, which the gendarme's practice eye had perceived, Dante sprang forward to precipitate himself into the sea. But four vigorous arms seized him, as his feet quitted the bottom of the boat. He fell back, cursing with rage. Good, said the gendarme, placing his knee on his chest. This is the way you keep your word as a sailor. Believe soft-spoken gentlemen again. Hark ye, my friend, I have disobeyed my first order, but I will not disobey the second, and if you move, I will blow your brains out and he leveled his carbine at Dante, who felt the muzzle against his temple. For a moment the idea of struggling crossed his mind, and of so ending the unexpected evil that had overtaken him. But he bethought him of Monsieur de Villefort's promise, and besides, death in a boat from the hand of a gendarme seemed too terrible. He remained motionless, but gnashing his teeth and wringing his hands with fury. 
at this moment, and the boat came to a landing with a violent shock. One of the sailors leaped on shore. A cord creaked as it ran through a pulley, and Dante guessed they were at the end of the voyage, and that they were moving the boat. His guards, taking him by the arms and coat collar, forced him to rise and dragged him towards the steps that led to the gate of the fortress. While the police officer, carrying a musket with fixed bayonet, followed him. Dante made no resistance. He was like a man in a dream. He saw soldiers drawn up on the embankment. He knew vaguely that he was ascending a flight of steps. He was conscious that he passed through a door, and that the door closed behind him. But all this indistinctly, as through a mist. He did not even see the ocean, that terrible barrier against freedom, which the prisoners look upon with utter despair. They halted for a minute, during which he strove to collect his thoughts. He looked round. He was in a court surrounded by high walls. He heard the measured threat of sentinels. And, as they passed before the light, he saw the barrels of their muskets shine. They waited upwards of ten minutes. Certain that he could not escape, the gendarmes released him. They seemed awaiting orders. The orders came. Where is the prisoner? said a voice. Here, replied the gendarme. Let him follow me. I will take him to his cell. Go, said the gendarme, thrusting Dante forward. The prisoner followed his guide, who led him into a room almost on the ground, whose bare and reeking walls seemed as though impregnated with tears. A lamp placed on a stool illuminated the apartment faintly, and showed Dante the features of his conductor, an underjailer, ill-clothed and of sullen appearance. Here is your chamber for tonight, said he. It is late, and the governor is asleep. Tomorrow, perhaps, he may change you. In the meantime, there is bread, water, and fresh straw, and that is all a prisoner can wish for. Good night. And before Dante could open his mouth, before he had noticed where the jailer placed his bread or the water, before he had glanced towards the corner where the straw was, the jailer disappeared, taking with him the lamp and closing the door leaving stamped upon the prisoner's mind the dim reflection of the dripping walls of his dungeon. Dante was alone in darkness and in silence. Cold as the shadows that he felt breathe on his burning forehead. With the first dawn of day, the jailer returned, with orders to leave Dante where he was. He found the prisoner in the same position, as if fixed there, his eyes swollen with weeping. He had passed the night standing, and without sleep. The jailer advanced. Dante appeared not to perceive him. He touched him on the shoulder. Edmund started. Have you not slept? said the jailer. I do not know, replied Dante. The jailer stared. Are you hungry? continued he. I do not know. Do you wish for anything? I wish to see the governor. The jailer shrugged his shoulders and left the chamber. Dante followed him with his eyes and stretched forth his hands towards the open door, but the door closed. All his emotion then burst forth. He cast himself on the ground, weeping bitterly, and asking himself what crime he had committed that he was thus punished. 
The days passed thus. He scarcely tasted food, but walked round and round the cell like a wild beast in its cage. One thought in particular tormented him, namely, that during his journey hither he had sat so still, whereas he might a dozen times have plunged into the sea, and, thanks to his powers of swimming, for which he was famous, have gained the shore, concealed himself, until the arrival of a Genoese or a Spanish vessel, escaped to Spain or Italy, where Mercedes and his father could have joined him. He had no fears as to how he should live. Good seamen are welcome everywhere. He spoke Italian like a Tuscan, and Spanish like a Castilian. He would have been free and happy with Mercedes and his father. Whereas he was now confined in the Chateau d'If, that impregnable fortress ignorant of the future destiny of his father and Mercedes, and all this because he had trusted to Villefort's promise. The thought was maddening, and Dante threw himself furiously down on his straw. The next morning, at the same hour, the jailer came again. Well, said the jailer, are you more reasonable today? Dante made no reply. Come, cheer up. Is there anything that I can do for you? I wish to see the governor. I have already told you it was impossible. Why so? Because it is against prison rules, and prisoners must not even ask for it. What is allowed, then? Better fare if you pay for it books, and leave to walk about. I do not want books. I am satisfied with my food, and do not care to walk about, but I wish to see the governor. If you worry me by repeating the same thing, I will not bring you any more to eat. Well then, said Edmund, if you do not, I shall die of hunger, that is all. The jailer saw by his tone he would be happy to die, and as every prisoner is worth ten sous a day to his jailer, he replied in a more subdued tone. What you ask is impossible, but if you are very well behaved, you will be allowed to walk about, and some day you will meet the governor, and if he chooses to reply, that is his affair. But asked Dante, how long shall I have to wait? Ah, a month, six months, a year. It is too long a time. I wish to see him at once. Ah, said the jailer, do not always brood over what is impossible, or you will be mad in a fortnight. You think so? Yes, we have an instance here. It was by always offering a million of francs to the governor for his liberty that an abbé became mad who was in this chamber before you. How long has he left it? Two years. Was he liberated then? No, he was put in a dungeon. Listen, said Dante, I am not an abbé. I am not mad. Perhaps I shall be, but at present, unfortunately. I am not. I will make you another offer. What is it? I do not offer you a million, because I have it not. But I will give you a hundred crowns, if, the first time you go to Marseille, you will seek out a young girl named Mercedes, at the Catalans, and give her two lines for me. If I took them and were detected, I should lose my place, which is worth two thousand francs a year. So that I shall be a great fool to run such a risk for three hundred. Well, said Dante, mark this. If you refuse at least to tell Mercedes I am here, I will some day hide myself behind the door, and when you enter, 
I will dash out your brains with this stool. Threats, cried the jailer, retreating and putting himself on the defensive. You are certainly going mad. The abbe began like you, and in three days you will be like him, mad enough to tie up. But fortunately, there are dungeons here. Dante whirled the stool around his head. All right, all right, said the jailer, all right, since you will have it so. I will send word to the governor. Very well, returned Dante, dropping the stool and sitting on it, as if he were in reality mad. The jailer went out and returned in an instant with a corporal and four soldiers. By the governor's orders, said he, conduct the prisoner to the tier beneath. The dungeon, then, said the corporal. Yes, we must put the madman with the madmen. The soldier seized Dante, who followed passively. He descended fifteen steps, and the door of a dungeon was opened, and he was thrust in. The door closed, and Dante advanced with outstretched hands until he touched the wall. He then sat down in the corner, until his eyes became accustomed to the darkness. The jailer was right. Dante wanted but little of being utterly mad. Chapter 9 The Evening of the Betrothal Villefort had, as we have said, hastened back to Madame de saint merans in the Place du Grand Cour, and on entering the house, found that the guests whom he had left at the table were taking coffee in the salon. René was, with all the rest of the company, anxiously awaiting him, and his entrance was followed by a general exclamation. Well, decapitator, guardian of the state, royalist, Brutus, what is the matter? said one. Speak out. Are we threatened with a fresh reign of terror? asked another. Has the Corsican ogre broken loose? cried a third. Marquise, said Wilfour, approaching his future mother-in-law. I request your pardon for thus leaving you. Will the Marquis honor me by a few moments' private conversation? Ah, it is really a serious matter, then, asked the Marquis, remarking the cloud on Villefort's brow. So serious that I must take leave of you for a few days. So, added he, turning to René, judge for yourself if it be not important. You are going to leave us? cried René, unable to hide her emotion at this unexpected announcement. Alas, returned the four, I must. Where, then, are you going? asked the Marquise. That, madam, is an official secret, but if you have any commissions for Paris, a friend of mine is going there tonight, and will with pleasure undertake them. The guests looked at each other. You wish to speak to me alone, said the Marquis. Yes, let us go to the library, please. The Marquis took his arm, and they left the salon. Well, asked he, as soon as they were by themselves, tell me what it is. An affair of the greatest importance that demands my immediate presence in Paris. Now, excuse the indiscretion, Marquis, but have you any landed property? All my fortune is in the funds, a seven or eight hundred thousand francs. Then sell out, sell out, Marquis, or you will lose it all. But how can I sell out here? You have a broker, have you not? Yes. Then give me a letter to him, and tell him to sell out without an instant's delay. Perhaps even now I shall arrive too late. The deuce you say, 
replied the Marquis. Let us lose no time, then. And, sitting down, he wrote a letter to his broker, ordering him to sell out the market price. Now then, said Villefort, placing the letter in his pocket-book, I must have another. To whom? To the king. To the king? Yes. I dare not write to his majesty. I do not ask you to write to his majesty, but ask Monsieur de Salvier to do so. I want a letter that will enable me to reach the king's presence without all the formalities of demanding an audience. That would occasion a loss of precious time. But address yourself to the keeper of the seals. He has the right of entry at the Tuileries, and can procure you audience at any hour of the day or night. And doubtless, but there is no occasion to divide the honors of my discovery with him. The keeper would leave me in the background, and take all the glory to himself. I tell you, Marquis, my fortune is made if I only reach the Tuileries the first, for the king will not forget the service I do him. In that case, go and get ready. I will call Salvieux, and make him write the letter. Be as quick as possible. I must be on the road in a quarter of an hour. Tell your coachman to stop at the door. You will present my excuses to the Marquise and Mademoiselle René, whom I leave on such a day with great regret. You will find them both here, and can make your farewells in person. A thousand thanks, and now for the letter. The Marquis rang. A servant entered. Say to the Corps de Savier that I would like to see him. Now then, go, said the Marquis. I shall be gone only a few moments. Before hastily quitted the apartment, but reflecting that the sight of the deputy procureur running through the streets would be enough to throw the whole city into confusion. He resumed his ordinary pace. At his door he perceived a figure in the shadow that seemed to wait for him. It was Mercedes, who, hearing no news of her lover, had come unobserved to inquire after him. As Villefort drew near, she advanced and stood before him. Dante had spoken of Mercedes, and Villefort instantly recognized her. Her beauty and high bearing surprised him, and when she inquired what had become of her lover, it seemed to him that she was the judge, and he the accused. The young man you speak of, said Villefort abruptly, is a great criminal, and I can do nothing for him, mademoiselle. Mercedes burst into tears, and as Villefort strove to pass her, again addressed him. But at least tell me where he is, that I may know whether he is alive or dead, said she. I do not know. He is no longer in my hands, replied Villefort. And desirous of putting an end to the interview, he pushed by her and closed the door, as if to exclude the pain he felt. But remorse is not thus banished. Like Virgil's wounded hero, he carried the error in his wound. And arrived at the salon, Villefort uttered a sigh that was almost a sob and sank into a chair. Then the first pangs of an unending torture seized upon his heart. The man he sacrificed to his ambition, that innocent victim, immolated on the altar of his father's faults, appeared to him pale and threatening, leading his affianced bride by the hand and bringing with him remorse, not such as the ancients figured, furious and terrible, but that slow and consuming agony, whose pangs are intensified from hour to hour, up to the very moment of death. 
Then he had a moment's hesitation. He had frequently called for capital punishment on criminals, and, owing to his irresistible eloquence, they had been condemned. And yet, the slightest shadow of remorse had never clouded Villefort's brow. Because they were guilty. At least, he believed so. But here was an innocent man whose happiness he had destroyed. In this case, he was not the judge, but the executioner. As he thus reflected, he felt the sensation we have described, and which had hitherto been unknown to him, arise in his bosom, and fill him with vague apprehensions. It is thus that a wounded man trembles instinctively at the approach of the finger to his wound, until it be healed. But the force was one of those that never close, or if they do, only close to reopen more agonizing than ever. If at this moment the sweet voice of René had sounded in his ears, pleading for mercy, or the fair Mercedes had entered and said, in the name of God, I conjure you to restore me my affianced husband. His cold and trembling hands would have signed his release. But no voice broke the stillness of the chamber, and the door was opened only by Villefort's valet, who came to tell him that the travelling carriage was in readiness. Villefort rose or rather sprang from his chair, hastily opened one of the drawers of his desk, emptied all the gold it contained into his pocket, stood motionless an instant, his hand pressed to his head, muttered a few inarticulate sounds, and then, perceiving that his servant had placed his cloak on his shoulders, he sprang into the carriage, ordering the postilions to drive to Monsieur de Saint-Mérens. The hapless Dante was doomed. As the Marquis had promised, Villefort found the Marquise and René in waiting. He started when he saw René, for he fancied she was again about to plead for Dante. Alas, her emotions were wholly personal she was thinking only of Villefort's departure. She loved Villefort, and he left her at the moment he was about to become her husband. Villefort knew not when he should return, and René, far from pleading for Dante, hated the man whose crime separated her from her lover. Meanwhile, what of Mercedes? She had met Fernand at the corner of the Rue de la Loge. She had returned to the Catalans and had despairingly cast herself on her couch. Fernand, kneeling by her side, took a hand and covered it with kisses that Mercedes did not even feel. She passed the night thus. The lamp went out for want of oil, but she paid no heed to the darkness. And dawn came, but she knew not that it was day. Grief had made her blind to all but one object. That was Edmund. Ah, you are there, said she, at length, turning towards Fernand. I have not quitted you since yesterday, returned Fernand sorrowfully. Monsieur Morel had not readily given up the fight. He had learned that Dante had been taken to prison, and he had gone to all his friends and to the influential persons of the city. But the report was already in circulation that Dante was arrested as a Bonapartist agent, and as the most sanguine looked upon at any attempt of Napoleon to remount the throne as impossible, he met with nothing but refusal, and had returned home in despair, declaring that the matter was serious and that nothing more could be done. Caderousse was equally restless and uneasy. 
but instead of seeking, like Monsieur Morel, to aid Dante, he had shut himself up with two bottles of black currant brandy, in the hope of drowning reflection. But he did not succeed, and became too intoxicated to fetch any more drink, and yet not so intoxicated as to forget what had happened. With his elbows on the table, he sat between the two empty bottles, while Spectus danced in the light of the unsnuffed candle. A Spectus such as Hoffman strews over his punch-drenched pages, like black, fantastic dust. Dangla alone was content and joyous. He had got rid of an enemy and made his own situation on the pharaoh secure. Danglars was one of those men born with a pen behind the ear and an inkstand in place of a heart. Everything with him was multiplication or subtraction. The life of a man was to him of far less value than a numeral, especially when by taking it away he could increase the sum total of his own desires. He went to bed at his usual hour, and slept in peace. Villefort, after having received Monsieur de Sauvier's letter, embraced René, kissed the Marquise's hand, and shaken that of the Marquis, started for Paris along the A road. Old Dante was dying with anxiety to know what had become of Edmund. But we know very well what had become of Edmund.